welcome. It's uh, very nice to be actually presenting in Brussels in a blockchain event. It's not very um, usual. Um, so I want to give you a different perspective of uh, what the European Commission is actually doing. Uh, as you could uh, hear, I, there's a lot of echo. I know that the sound is not perfect. Uh, let's, uh, yeah, let's do it like this. Is it, is it better? Right? It's not like... Um, I would like to give you a different uh, perspective of what the Commission does in the space of blockchain and Web3. Because most of you, you associate the Commission to regulations and laws, and they come out, you know, and they will come out of nowhere, and uh, we cannot escape. Uh, but there is also another softer, gentler side of the Commission, and that is where I come from. I come from actually the people that, like you, are working on the technologies. So I do work on blockchain, and I do work on Web3, and I don't do any sort of regulation. I'm actually, like you, trying to understand how we can use that technology to improve society. So that's my objective, and that's what I'm going to talk to you about in, let's say, 10, 15 minutes. And then if you want to interact, I think we still will have some time. So European Commission, Director General for Informatics, it's really the technical arm of the Commission. And uh, what we will be talking about is about the other side of the Commission. So what Joana explained to you is the side of the Commission that most of you know, which is the Commission creates EU regulations that are then enforced and that somehow at some point you will know about them because you will have to, I don't know, send some form somewhere or have to do some more reporting that in the past you had no idea that it was needed. So that's the regulation part of the Commission where we can see that there is a lot of action on Web2 with the, the DSA and DMA. I guess most of you know about the, these two things. Anyone knows about them? Yeah? You know what the DSA and the DMA are? Very good. So the exchanges with Musk are about the DSA and the DMA. And if you have no clue about what I'm telling you, go online and Google it. <laughs> then we have the Web3 side, where definitely we have the Mika, and we also have the EIDAS revision and the so-called UDI wallet. So those are things that are currently happening. But at the same time, the Commission also does enablement. So it means that the Commission works with the member states in using the technologies. And many times, if you are a company, you must kind of know this, there are grants. So there is also a financial incentive to the ecosystem to participate in the work of the Commission and in the work of the member states. So you, as a company, typically can participate and you will receive some incentive to join you know, that project, that European project. The European project I'm most involved in is the European Blockchain Services Infrastructure, which is EBSI in short. And I want to know if anyone has ever heard about EBSI in this room. Those guys there, fantastic. So congratulations. Um, for the ones that don't have an idea what I'm talking about, it's great because you will learn something. Might be useful at some point. Um, in case you go to a I don't know, trivia, you know, and on blockchain, it might show up. So keep attentive. So the idea there is that the member states have, together with the Commission, committed to also use blockchain and Web3 technologies for the good of society. They want to understand the technology and they want to apply the technology. And actually what we are doing is to create an entire blockchain separate from all the blockchains that you know, dedicated to the public sector, to the European public sector. And that is EBSI. Not only the blockchain, but also all the layers on top. So how does that look? Well, essentially, what we are all here to discuss and to understand is this move from Web 2 to Web 3. 
And I'm going to give you a perspective from the public sector, but I believe that it makes sense to a private company or to an individual. So if we look at Web2, which is the web that we use, what we have is these large plat platforms like you know, Google, Facebook, or Meta, um, Apple, Microsoft. And these large platforms, you might know or not know, of course, they amass huge amounts of data. And that data is then used for prof profit motive, essentially. And they continue to grow. Now, that has been great because it's very convenient. We went from a, a cha chaotic web, or web one, to something that allows us to access information. So this is why we Google and why we use our iPhone. But at the same time, there are more and more concerns about the fact that these platforms are actually gathering too much power with the data they hold. And I personally believe that we can impose a lot of regulations on Web2, like the DSA or the DMA. We can try to regulate and control. But it makes a lot more sense to look at the future and look at Web3. That's my personal view. So instead of trying to say, well, let's see if we can make these guys actually play by the rules and see how tough we are, we could also look and say, well, if Web3 actually goes somewhere, hopefully, we will have the data they hold actually no longer in a centralized place. Because that's what the blockchain actually brings. It brings the opportunity to have a data commons that is not controlled by a central provider. It's actually a part of a community, and the consensus mechanism you know, does the creation, the block creation. And also, we have the wallet. And the wallet is the new user interface where we can have our data and actually share it with whom we want without having the platform in between. And understanding wherever we go on the web and using that information not only for selling more advertising, but also to be able to create patterns and, you know, now with AI, improve the tracking on everything we do. So that's really the challenge, is to look at Web3 as an opportunity to cast away from, well, the less good things of Web2. I'm not saying everything is bad, but definitely something can be improved. And if you are wondering if this matters, I actually brought this very simple pixelized uh, uh, diagram of how large these companies actually are. So if you see there, Apple, Microsoft, they are trillion dollar companies. They are much larger than many of the countries we actually come from. This is the reality. They are larger than most countries in the world. Well, mo almost all of them. I mean, probably, uh, well, you know, trillion dollar companies. We just have a, a few of them. But this is how big these companies became, and now the question is, can we move to a web that is more transparent, more censorship resistant, and more open to innovation? And can the public sector join? Right? That's also the other point. So in my opinion, Web3 needs, on one hand, trust. People, for some reason, believe that blockchain is definitely something that cannot be trusted, whereas blockchain proposes that. And then ease of use. It's not easy. I mean, Web3 is not easy. I mean, if you ask your mother to install you know, a wallet and then connect and get an NFT, I mean, good luck with that. Um, and when she will sign three times a long thing, well, probably she will give up. Um, so if we look at tokens, which is the essential bit of this new Web3 that we are uh, all involved in, I would say that the public sector makes sense to be involved because if we look at the landscape, what we have is the cryptocurrency part, which typically can also be a utility token like ERC20 tokens, uh, which express cryptocurrency value. You have ownership tokens, the so-called NFTs, which can be either digital native things like the JPEG, but can also be an expensive bottle of wine. We are seeing more and more the so-called digital twin. So I own something, but I also have a digital ownership token 
that allows me to prove ownership over that asset. And then thirdly, that this is the discussion I'm, I'm having here, and I want to write more about it, is what I call reputation or evidence of something. You can see it either as reputation or evidence of something. Because the thing is that when you interact with a wallet, you have no idea who is behind it. So what we are seeing emerging is the possibility of giving reputation tokens or evidence tokens so that the service knows I'm actually based in Europe. Can be that, that the service needs to know. For you to access, I don't know, a loan, a loan can be an insurance, a Web3 insurance, a Web3 loan, you might need to know the location, right? So you need somehow to know more than this is just a very long, you know, idea of a wallet, a wallet ID. So having that in mind, and having that we have the possibility to do that with Web3 technologies, and there I'm talking about the sole bound tokens of Vitalik, but also W3C has something called verifiable credentials that can be used as evidence in a Web3 transaction, even with a smart contract. And what we are doing in EBSI is to have the public administrations try out to express the information they have. Don't forget they are authentic sources of information, meaning if I want to prove that I live in Excel, I go to a public administration to get that proof. So in the future, I could get a token that can be then consumed even by a smart contract to prove that I'm actually from Excel and that you know, I moved here 10 years ago, which actually was 20, but doesn't matter. So you get the point. The point is the public sector has also a role to play in the future of the web, not only regulating, but also participating. And that participation, in my opinion, can be this role of providing us with evidence tokens or reputation tokens. You can call them as you like. It's still identity is also a very used word, so that we can trust Web3. Because if we trust the public sector, then we can trust who is actually using that service. I hope this was, let's say, a different take of what the Commission is doing, what the public sector can do, what role it can play. And I want to finish with this um, slide that essentially says that what I'm telling you um, is that if Web3 is to evolve, it will not continue without having an understanding of who is behind the wallet. If the services are going to evolve from purely transactional services to more, let's say, complex services like loans, microloans, and if they are to evolve to insurance based on like Web3 type of service, we will need to have additional information about the people transacting. And that can be done with Web3 technologies. And there are different projects working on that. So I told you about EBSI, which comes from the public sector side. But we also see, if you look at it, the work of um, Ethereum with the uh, soul bound tokens. If you read the paper, it's exactly the same. Uh, it's called Decentralized Society. Um, there is, for example, Disco, which we will be having a um, podcast and to understand how they are using verifiable credentials. And I think Polygon was here as well with Polygon, Polygon ID and with uh, their zero knowledge uh, identity uh, technology. And there is us, EBSI, which is also, let's say, part of the picture with different projects in the public sector using verifiable credentials and making sure that the public sector plays a role in the future of the web Again, not only regulating, but also participating. And I have 13 seconds to wish you a good continuation of the event. And uh, I think the slides will be available. And in case you have any questions or you would like to, to know more, just go online or ping us. Okay? Thank you very much.